Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our event, Does the 14th Amendment Prohibit Abortion? My name is Chloe Knox, and I'm the Vice President for Speakers for UVA's Federalist Society chapter. The Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies is a group of conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order. It is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is not what it should be. Tonight, we're joined by Joshua Craddock and Professor Lois Shepard. Josh Craddock is an affiliated scholar with the James Wilson Institute. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he served as editor-in-chief of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. He later clerked for the Honorable Chief Judge Timothy Timkovich of the Tenth Circuit. Prior to law school, Mr. Craddock managed advocacy teams for several nonprofit organizations at the United Nations, and participated in negotiations on the Sustainable Development Goals. His writing has appeared in the Notre Dame Law Review, Harvard Journal on Legislation, the Tennessee Journal of Law and Policy, Newsweek, and National Review. Lois Shepard is an expert in the fields of health law and bioethics. Her primary appointment is in UVA Medical School's Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, where she directs the center's programs in medicine and law. She teaches courses in healthcare law and ethics at both the law school and the medical school. She received her law degree from Yale University, where she served as a senior editor of the Yale Law Journal. She then practiced corporate law at Robinson Bradshaw in Charlotte, North Carolina. She began her academic career in 1993 at the Florida State University College of Law. Professor Shepard's current scholarly and teaching interests involve legal and ethical issues at the end of life and in human subject research. Mr. Craddock, Professor Shepard, thanks so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate it, and I'm very excited to hear what you both have to say. Um, for the audience members, so you're aware, the format of this evening will be that uh, Josh will speak first, followed by Professor Shepard, and then I will come back and facilitate Q&A. While both of them are speaking, you guys can ask questions one of two ways. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and I'll read your question aloud. And alternatively, you can raise your hand, and I can unmute you so you can ask your question um, allowed to our panelists. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Josh. Thanks so much, Chloe, and thanks to the Federal Society at UVA for inviting me to speak today. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you digitally via Zoom. Uh, I also want to extend my thanks to Professor Shepard for offering her commentary today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing her comments and perspective. So with that, let's uh, jump into it. As many of you know, the 1973 Supreme Court decision Roe v. Wade required states to allow abortion. The seven men forming the majority said that the right to privacy includes a woman's decision to end the life of her preborn child, effectively through all nine months of pregnancy. This decision was widely criticized in its legal reasoning, even by scholars who support abortion, but its central holding was reaffirmed in the 1992 decision, Casey versus Planned Parenthood. If any of you watched the uh, recent confirmation hearings for Judge Amy Coney Barrett, one of the defining questions in those confirmation hearings was whether she would vote to overturn Roe. Personally, I think it's unlikely in the near future, and at least if this term's June medical decision uh, is any indication. Uh, but I do think that her confirmation changes the dynamic of the court, and suddenly that prospect is not unthinkable. So it's worth considering what the legal landscape would look like if Roe were overturned. The conventional wisdom is that reversing Roe would simply return the issue of abortion to the states and that each state would decide for itself whether to legalize or prohibit abortion. Even the late Justice Scalia held this view. He wrote in his Planned Parenthood versus Casey opinion that the Constitution says absolutely nothing about abortion. In his view, the 14th Amendment's guarantees of due process and equal protection for all persons did not encompass prenatal life. Instead, the question of whether abortion should be decided state by state through the political process, he viewed as democratic choice. In a 2008 interview, Justice Scalia said, quote, there are anti-abortion people who think that the Constitution requires a state to prohibit abortion. They say that the Equal Protection Clause requires that you treat a helpless human being that's still in the womb the way that you treat other human beings. I think that's wrong. I think that when the Constitution says that persons are entitled to equal protection of the laws, I think it clearly means walking around persons. So let's leave aside for, the, for a moment the implication that the Constitution might only protect walking around person. Does it, by implication, have anything to say about abortion? 
the question I want to focus on is, does the Constitution really only protect walking around persons? Or is there a plausible counter argument based on the meaning of the term person as used in the 14th Amendment? I attempted to do that in my article published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy titled Protecting Prenatal Persons. The structure of the argument is pretty simple. First, the 14th Amendment's use of the word person guarantees due process and equal protection to all members of the human species within the geog geographic and jurisdictional power of the Constitution. Two, the preborn are members of the human species from the moment of fertilization. Three, the 14th Amendment protects the preborn from fertilization. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down on the minor premise that preborn human beings are biological members of the human species. But I'd like to stipulate that it's scientifically well established that human, unborn human beings are members of the species Homo sapiens from fertilization. There was actually a recent survey of biologists that found that 95% agreed that human life begins at fertilization, regardless of biologists' view on abortion. This was widely known even long before Roe v. Wade. For example, Dr. Bradley Patton of Michigan Medical School wrote in his 1964 Foundations of Embryology textbook, that the union of two such sex cells to form a zygote constitutes the process of fertilization and initiates the life of a new individual. Dr. Matthews Roth of Harvard University Medical School later said, it's incorrect to say that the biological data can't be decisive. It's scientifically correct to say that an individual human life begins at conception and that this developing human is always a member of our species in all stages of its life. But let's put a pin in that discussion and return to what this means for law. Regardless of what constitutional interpretive methodology you ascribe to, I think there's a compelling case that the 14th Amendment's protections extend to the unborn and that the Constitution in fact prohibits states from legalizing abortion. From a living constitutional perspective, the story of our Constitution is the story of expanding rights to more and more members of the human family based on broadening notions of and a better understanding of human dignity and equality. So on that view, the violence of abortion is incompatible with the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. In this talk, however, I'm primarily going to argue from an originalist perspective, which is to say on Justice Scalia's own terms. Why? Well, nearly half of the Supreme Court, once uh, as we expect just, uh, Judge Coney Barrett will be uh, confirmed, and most of the justices who would likely vote to overturn Roe are to some degree originalist in their methodology. That is, they seek to ascertain the original meaning of the constitutional text and apply it faithfully. So if you'll accept with me that minor premise that the preborn child in the womb is a member of the human species, all that must be demonstrated is that the term person in its original public meaning at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption and ratification applied to all members of the human species. I wanna draw on three strands of evidence to support that conclusion. First, dictionaries of common and legal usage at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption defined the terms person and human being interchangeably. The original public meaning of the term person included every member of the human race. Furthermore, use of the term person in statutes and court cases referred specifically to the unborn in many instances. Second, centuries of common law precedent and state practice leading up to the 14th Amendment's adoption in 1868 indicates that the unborn were considered legal persons. And third, the authors of the 14th Amendment expected it to protect every human being, especially the weakest and most marginalized. And that original expected application isn't conclusive of the original public public meaning, but it is indicative, and it demonstrates that informed citizens believe that the text of the 14th Amendment applied to every human being without exception. So I'll address each of those points in turn. First, let's start with the text. Dictionaries of common and legal usage at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption treated the word person as interchangeable with human being, man, woman, child. For example, the 1864, 1864 edition of Noah Webster's Dictionary of the English Language defined the term person as relating to, quote, especially to a living human being, a man, woman, or child, unquote. The entry for human includes those belonging to, quote, the race of man. And no dictionary of the era referenced birth or the status of being born in its definition of person, man, or human being. In legal usage, the term person also had expansive scope. Alexander Burrell's New Law Dictionary and Glossary defined person as a human being, considered as the subject of rights as distinguished from a thing. 
And that's consistent with Blackstone, for whom there was no distinction between biological human life and legal personhood. As part of his discourse on the rights of persons in his authoritative commentaries on the laws of England, Blackstone wrote that natural persons are such as the God of nature formed us, perhaps echoing the words of the psalmist who wrote, you formed my inward parts and knitted me together in my mother's womb. Blackstone declared that life is a right inherent by nature in every individual, and it begins in contemplation of law as soon as an infant is able to stir in the mother's womb. As I explained in my article, this mention of the unborn child's stirring was intended to protect prenatal life as soon as it can be dis discerned, not to exclude human life from protection prior to that point. It is proper to derive the principle from Blackstone and other legal treatise writers that if human life could be shown to exist, legal personhood existed also. So now that we're equipped to understand the meaning of the word as it was used in 1868, let's look at how it's used in the text of the 14th Amendment itself. The opening phrase of the amendment, the citizenship clause, says that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. You'll notice that it doesn't define the scope of the class persons. Rather, born or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction thereof serve to narrow the broader class of persons to which the term refers to the narrower subset of citizens. Prior to the adoption of the amendment, foreign nationals and Native Americans, for example, were considered persons, but most of the time they weren't considered citizens. In fact, the term person has always been larger than its subset citizen, and the Supreme Court's longstanding interpretation of the 14th Amendment in cases like Yick Wo versus Hopkins reflect, reflects that traditional understanding. So Justice Blackmun's intratextual analysis in Roe and concluding observation that the usage of person has, quote, application only postnatally draws an unsupported conclusion from the text. Justice Blackmun went through all the times that the word person is used elsewhere in the Constitution to try to discern what it meant in the 14th Amendment. But as Akhil Amar has pointed out in his article on intratextualism, it's very difficult to prove what a word couldn't mean through negative inferences alone. So to illustrate the problem, you could draw an opposite and perhaps equally unsupported conclusion from the text uh, through the use of the phrase persons born or naturalized in that citizenship clause. You could say that the adjective naturalized indicates that there are persons who are not naturalized. And then if born functions in the same way to limit the category of persons eligible for citizenship, it indicates that there are persons who are not born. I think that argument is just as defensible as the one that Justice Blackman makes, which is to say, not very defensible. So now, before we turn to the next line of evidence, I just want to point out that at this point, I think my case is proven. The term person in 1868 definitively included all human beings. And whether the states historically believed that the unborn specifically were members of the human species doesn't matter, as long as they believed all human beings are entitled to protection of the 14th Amendment. So to borrow from Justice Scalia here, just as freedom of speech protects movies and internet communication under an originalist framework, even though those technologies didn't exist at the time of the First Amendment's adoption, person protects every member of the human species, regardless of whether individuals were recognized as such at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption. The meaning of the relevant text doesn't evolve, it's just applied to a new set of circumstances or new information. But as it turns out, states did historically believe that the unborn were living members of the human family. And that leads me to the second line of evidence, which is the common law, common law precedent and state practice on abortion. The English common law tradition, which the U.S. inherited and developed after its independence, consistently treated abortion as the wrongful taking of a human life. Abortion was prohibited as soon as life in the womb could be detected. Prior to the advent of modern medical science, unborn life was detected at quickening, as we discussed a moment ago, that is, at the first perceived fetal movement. And that was a useful evidentiary tool for determining whether an abortion had actually taken place, because there was great difficulty in proving that the child was alive at the time of abortion. And proving that the child is alive was actually necessary to proving the crime of abortion at common law. So legal giants like Lord Cook and Blackstone formalized the legal principles protecting prenatal life, which were eventually passed on to the American colonies and adopted into their state common law systems. When embryologists discovered in the 1830s that each human individual begins his or her life cycle at fertilization, the states actually rapidly discarded the obsolete quickening standard in favor of a new medically accurate fertilization standard. So for example, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled in 1850 that, quote, the moment the womb is instinct with embryo life and gestation has begun, the crime of abortion may be perpetrated. 
there was therefore a crime at common law. This passage is indicative of the national mood regarding abortion in that era. And I think the 1851 case of Smith versus State uh, from the Supreme Judicial Court of Maine likewise upheld a statute that discarded that old quickening standard in favor of the new information. By the time the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, the states widely recognized unborn children as persons. 23 states and six territories referred to the fetus as a child in their anti-abortion statutes. 28 listed abortion among their statutory offenses against the person or a functionally equivalent classification. And in a particularly striking example, the same Ohio legislature that ratified the 14th Amendment in January 1867 passed legislation criminalizing abortion at all stages in three months later in April. The committee that actually reviewed the bill, which was composed of several senators who had voted for ratification of the amendment, declared in their report that abortion, quote, at any stage of existence is child murder. So strong language. Some scholars like Yale law professor Reva Siegel have suggested that this trend was motivated by a concern for women's health or distrust of women's reproductive choices rather than by a recognition of the unborn child's common humanity. But I think that view is inconsistent with the fact that the anti-abortion statutes during this period increased the penalty for abortion if it were proved to have caused the unborn child's death, and a majority did so irrespective of the age of gestation. Maine, among other states, deemed prosecution for abortion fatally defective if it didn't allege the destruction of the child. In any case, the historical context of abortion at common law and its treatment in the years just prior to the adoption of the 14th Amendment provides what I think is strong evidence that the public meaning of the term person included the preborn. The third line of evidence I want to briefly consider is the amendment's anticipated application. The framers of the amendment themselves certainly thought that their amendment required due process and equal protection for every human being. And while the intentions of the drafters of the 14th Amendment don't directly govern the meaning of the text, it's worth wondering whether a radically inclusive amendment could reasonably be interpreted to exclude a subset of individuals who were considered human beings at the time it was written, and who we now know more than ever to be a part of the human family. The primary framer of the 14th Amendment, Representative John Bingham, believed the amendment prevented states from refusing, quote, any of the rights which pertain to common humanity. Senator Jacob Howard, who sponsored the amendment in the Senate, emphasized that it guaranteed even the lowest and most despised members of the human race equal protection of the laws. During the congressional debates, Representative James Brown rhetorically asked, does the term person carry with it anything further than a simple allusion to the existence of the individual? The drafters of the amendment carefully crafted the text to include all human beings within its jurisdictional reach, regardless of their origin or circumstance. As Justice Hugo Black later put it, the history of the 14th Amendment proves that people were told that its purpose was to protect weak and helpless human beings. Their widely shared belief sheds light on the amendment's public meaning at the time of its adoption. The 14th Amendment was meant to be a new birth of freedom for all human beings. So what does this mean for our current regime of abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy as established in Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton? In his Roe majority opinion, Justice Harry Blackman acknowledged that if, quote, personhood is established, the case for a constitutional right to abortion, quote, collapses, for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the amendment. Under an originalist interpretation of the constitution, the edifice supporting Roe and its progeny crumbles. Given the original public meaning of the term person, the contemporaneous anti-abortion statutes that were purposed to protect prenatal, prenatal life, and the public explanations given by the framers of the 14th Amendment as to its scope of meaning, the historical evidence supports extending protections to prenatal life on originalist grounds. You might be wondering though, where's the state action? Even if the unborn were included within the meaning of the term person, how could it be that there's any state action that would make the 14th Amendment applicable? Well, as you know, a state's failure to protect an individual against private violence doesn't typically constitute a violation of the Due Process Clause. You might recall from DeShaney versus Winnebago County, if you took that case in con law, as an example of that principle in action. But the DeShaney court qualified its holding by recognizing that the state may not, of course, selectively deny its protective services to certain disfavored minorities without violating the Equal Protection Clause. 
So to take an example, if a state, as a matter of de facto or de jure policy, declined to apply its homicide laws when the victim is African American, but prosecuted homicide as usual when the victim is of a, some other ethnicity, that would be a clear equal protection violation. So if constitutional protections for the unborn were acknowledged, a state couldn't refuse to prosecute the intentional killing of the unborn while continuing to prosecute homicide of other classes of persons without violating the equal protection clause. In light of the evidence, I think the Supreme Court should reverse course on abortion. But even if you're con you know, convinced of all the things I've said so far, so what? Even with the addition of Judge Barrett, a minority of the current court is identifiably originalist in their interpretive method. And even those justices who ascribe to originalism might fear taking such a bold approach. So in that case, what's the path forward for extending constitutional protections to the unborn? I think that each branch and level of government actually has a role to play. First, Congress could act under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to enforce by appropriate legislation the con Constitution's protections for unborn persons, such as through the Life at Conception Act. Second, I think the executive could follow Lincoln's example to assert his departmental authority to interpret and uphold the Constitution. The president should fulfill his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. This might and should include, in my view, a rejection of judicial supremacy and the idea that Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. But I don't want to get bogged down too deeply on that point because it's not the topic of my scholarship. And the president does swear an oath to preserve the Constitution of the United States, not every pronouncement of the Supreme Court, but we'll, we'll leave it aside for now. Finally, I think that the states retain the primary duty to protect the inalienable rights of all human beings within their jurisdictions, the foremost of which is the right to life. States have a responsibility to exercise their police powers, that is their powers to promote public health, safety, and morals to prohibit abortion. State governors and legislators should do everything in their power to uphold the US Constitution on this point. And I think that state personhood initiatives and amendments uh, are an encouraging trend in that direction. And I hope we continue to see that effort play out. Until the Supreme Court, the people or the elected representatives undo the caste system of separate and unequal treatment for unborn persons, I believe there can be no true equal protection under the law. The legal regime that discriminates against preborn human beings should be abolished, restoring the harmony between science and law in a manner consistent with the Constitution. And now I look forward to hearing from Professor Shepard uh, comments and rebuttal. Well, thank you, Josh, for that really interesting presentation. Um, so um, when Chloe asked me to do this, um, so I, I don't know if I would call what I'm going to say a rebuttal, um, but I will lay out um, some thoughts. But, but I will note that um, in her email asking me to come speak with the group, she did talk about, you know, it was important to hear both sides. And so... You know, I, I, I looked at that email a few times and, and, and I thought, well, I think I'm going to start there because I don't think there are two sides. Um, I think, um, and, and I think thinking of two sides, um, uh, it, it, it is to all our benefit, I think, um, to start thinking and realizing that um, questions about the status of, of the fetus, about protection of vulnerable life, um, and about reproductive rights are extremely complex and people can have um, views about them that are not quite expected. Um, and that uh, don't go along like if, if you uh, are believe A, then you just follow along this line and you agree with all of these things. Or if you agree not A, right, then you come along when in fact there's way more between A and not A and then things don't necessarily follow along those lines either. So I just wanted to bring up a few examples in my own work. So some of the first articles I wrote um, when I became a law professor and Chloe pointed out, I uh, started my career in 1993. My first law review article was called Protecting Parents' Freedom to Have Children with Genetic Differences. Um, so, you know, and you get, a, you hear a lot these days and in the Supreme Court as well about um, the reason bans, right, uh, Indiana's law and, and the law in a few other states, new restrictions on abortion for reasons of the disability 
um, of the fetus. And a lot of people might not know, but it used to be that the period in which you could have an abortion was longer for uh, fetuses um, that um, had some kind of disabling condition. Um, but uh, uh, which makes the new, um, you know, prohibition against um, abortion in those contexts, you know, even more interesting to see, uh, you know, how the approach is very different. But um, in that early law review article, you know, I was uh, writing about my concerns at that time that people would feel uh, pressured um, to abort. Um, of uh, pregnancies um, uh, to terminate, pre oops. Sorry, I had a technical difficulty to, to, um, to terminate pregnancies um, because of disability. And that was at a time when insurance companies, that was during the heyday of HMOs, when some of them were in the beginning of prenatal testing were saying that they were gonna require you to have a prenatal test. And if the uh, fetus had a disability, they weren't gonna pay for that and you didn't abort. Uh, they weren't gonna pay for that child's medical care uh, because of a pre-existing condition. Um, so, and that was also during the time when there were um, the advent of wrongful life and wrongful birth lawsuits, which I don't want to get into the details there, but I, I, I'm just saying that, you know, to me, you can, you can have a position that's compatible with abortion rights and still have concerns about disability discrimination in the context of pregnancy and, and worry about social pressures uh, or legal pressures uh, to terminate a pregnancy because of disability. And my second law review article was actually, again, something that might be a little unexpected for someone who is strongly supportive of abortion rights, which I am, uh, which is that I am not uh, uh, in favor of physician-assisted suicide. You know, so again, you, you can't make assumptions, um, you know, that, that um, if, if you agree with one uh, position that everything else is going to fall and you're going to uh, understand where people come out on, on other issues, it's much more complex than that. Um, so another thing I'd like to say um, is that I think, yeah, even with understandings of the fetus, there aren't two sides, right? There are many more, right? There's not just baby at conception, personhood at conception, and uh, personhood uh, post-birth. Um, there's not uh, the, we shouldn't think of, of people's opinions as, and the only options available as all protection at conception um, um, uh, and, and, or no protection until after birth. In fact, our current compromise kind of situation that we have with Roe v. Wade and Casey um, are protections um, of potential fetal life up in, to a certain point. Um, I mean, after, after a certain point in development. Um, or thinking that people think either you have a whole person, you have mere tissue. So, so I, I guess what I, what I want to just point out is that um, there are a lot of different conceptions of personhood or of the um, strength of the protectable interest of the state if you don't want to go with personhood. Uh, so in a class I teach um, in the spring, Reproductive Ethics and Law, which I'd invite everybody to take if you're interested. It's a class that combines law and medical students, um, sometimes graduate nursing students and masters of public health students also join us. Um, we read various um, uh, uh, opinions, uh, including uh, uh, Pope John Paul II with respect to when um, uh, human life begins at conception, which I think Josh would probably agree with, um, to um, the brain life theory, which um, says at the beginning of development of the brain, which would be eight weeks, um, quickening, Josh already talked about, which was helpful. Um, some people want to put um, personhood or um, the, the protectable interest uh, that the state has in potential life at, at when a, a fetus might experience pain 
um, and there are disputes about when that might be, or other attributes. Um, so there are varying questions about when you might attach personhood or when you might attach certain protections. Um, I will say I'm obviously not an originalist and so I, I don't wanna, I, I, we can talk about that some and I have maybe some questions that I'd like if there aren't a bunch of questions from other people, I have some questions maybe I'd like to ask uh, Josh about that. Um, uh, but, but I would say, I, I wanna say a few words about your argument and then I wanna talk about consequences because I don't think you talked very much about that and I'd also like to hear what you have to say when you imagine what the consequences of determining that personhood begins at conception, uh, what those would be. So, but first just to um, address specifically some of your points with respect to, I think you called it your minor premise. Let me find it. Um, which is that uh, the preborn are members of the human species from fertilization, if I have that right. And you can correct me, and I don't mind if you interrupt me too with correction, so feel free. I'm a no, pretty that's informal right. It's, that's right, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, because I'm a pretty informal person. I, I, I love to have a conversation. So, um, uh, so here, uh, one thing I'd say to that is I think you read something about um, you know, biologists agree, you know, that life begins at conception. And I, and I guess that the thing I thought about when you said that was, well, it certainly doesn't start before then, right? So, so, so that, that is one way of understanding what, and I haven't read, you know, the full thing of what you were reading, but that's what occurred to me when you were saying that. Well, yeah, you know, we're not going to find the point before then, uh, but that doesn't answer the question of when personhood begins uh, and when we think of personhood as, um, as a morally important category uh, uh, and membership at, in, into the personhood category, like you were talking about, you know, animal thing or person is when rights attach. Um, but another thing you said, and this is, this, I'd be curious what you have to say about this with respect to, um, with respect to when you have that individual human life. And this is one of the difficulties with, or one of the um, critiques you, you read of um, Pope John Paul II's position, because right, his, his position is basically You've got all the human DNA then, right? And, and so that is the moment you've got that human genetic um, component put together at fertilization. And that's when you should think of personhood. But it's, it's actually for the first 14 days, um, uh, you don't necessarily have a human individual. So if you're talking about a member of the human species, you're talking about one. And with it, for the first 14 days after fertilization, um, you can have um, twinning, an embryo can divide, or you can have fusing. So you can have a chimera where the embryo fuses. So that's just one thing. I wonder how the people who argue personhood from conception deal with that argument that because it's 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 not you don't know yet if you have if you have one or if you have uh, two um, you know um, from that uh, time of fertilization. Um, I guess that also I I, I think um, Josh um, you were talking about person and human beings and and in my reading in this area. As people have written about personhood, or people have written about human beings over many years in association with rights, they haven't always been very careful about those two words and have kind of used those interchangeably. In other words, not thinking of simply human material, but a human being equating with, with persons, right? Um, and, and instead of it hasn't been important in a lot of the things that have been written over the many years to try to associate person being something that is associated with rights and human beings being in this more biological sense, I think that you're talking about. So I, 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 I kind of think you, you might, I mean, 
be reading more into some of those distinctions um, from the past um, than people were actually trying to make. Um, uh, with respect to, so those are just some things with respect to, I think, mostly your minor premise. And again, I have some questions if we have time, but other people, I want to give other people a chance um, on the originalist argument. I guess what I'd like to, to say, um, to put this in a little bit of context, and Chloe invited me to do that if, if I wanted to, which is, you know, what, what does this mean? What would this mean, right? And I guess, and I guess, I'm talking about personhood, period, because just so everybody's clear, right now the Constitution doesn't, uh, uh, constitutional interpretation by the Supreme Court does not consider fetuses persons um, at any point until they are born, right? Um, so, so there's one issue about, um, so, so some of the things I'm going to say are about just personhood generally for um, uh, uh, before birth, and then some that I, I guess it's mostly an intensification of some of these concerns if you put it actually at conception. Um, so uh, so I, I, some of these concerns I would have even if personhood is determined later, right? Um, the, uh, for example, at viability, but when the um, fetus is still uh, inside the pregnant person. So here are some of the concerns that I would have, well, that I have, or want to just point out the consequences is just, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just most obvious that, <laughs> that, that if, if fetuses or embryos, because Josh is also talking about embryos, are persons entitled to full equal rights because if they're persons, then they're entitled to equal protection, then women are not. Uh, women uh, will not be treated, cannot be treated the same as men. Um, and so even if you just look in situations of, um, of, of wanted pregnancies. And you think about the kind of surveillance and control we would have over women um, uh, uh, while they are pregnant, I think uh, that should raise a lot of concerns for a lot of people, especially for a group that is very interested to the extent many of you are members of the Federalist Society, and I'm sure there are other people here who aren't in the Federalist Society, but um, who are concerned about freedom. Um, I think the surveillance level that would be not only justified, but required in order to provide equal protection for these unborn persons, as Josh um, argues, um, that would be comparable to the protection provided for living children. Um, there would need to be a lot of surveillance of women's medical decisions um, of their habits in, in many ways of all of the things that they might do um, that might cause some unintended harm um, to uh, the unborn. So right now, so just to put it in context, already right now we have a lot of surveillance in terms of drug testing of pregnant women um, without their consent. And I'm sure a lot of you read the Ferguson decisions in uh, con law. Uh, still that is going on. Um, and uh, just within the last year, I've been asked to, um, to provide some guidance on a case in which um, a woman was, um, two women uh, were tested without their, con well, one was tested I think they were both tested without their consent. One uh, came up positive for a drug test um, because of um, a poppy seed bagel. Um, and her uh, child was removed, even though the, there was no um, sense of anything wrong with the born child. So this is a pregnancy full term, very much wanted pregnancy. Child was taken away from her um, for you know uh, a few days, just removed from her, um, which of course interfered with 
uh, nursing and, and that very important um, period of attachment bonding right after birth, devastating. Uh, the other woman was um, uh, also drug tested, negative, but she had answered on a questionnaire that she had uh, stopped um, using any drugs. I think she used marijuana uh, before pregnancy. She stopped at pregnancy uh, for, um, I think she had um, MS. Um, she stopped and, uh, but because she answered that questionnaire, child welfare officers came to her house several times, um, interviewed her younger child, um, uh, we're, you know, looking at the house and whether the household was safe, even though there were no signs of any drugs in the child. She didn't have any signs in, the, in her, uh, and, and she's totally scrutinized with respect to some drug use that occurred, you know, uh, way before pregnancy that she, or might have continued in the beginning of pregnancy, but she stopped. Um, and uh, her husband um, was never questioned about his drug use. Um, and although he also lived in that household. Um, the forced um, medical interventions um, are uh, very much of a concern now. And we're talking about, we don't even have fetal personhood or embryonic personhood. Um, where women have been forced to have C-sections, at least in one famous case, which actually hastened the death of a terminally ill woman. Um, there's a case where um, in Florida where sheriffs went and got a woman who was going to, planning to have a, um, who was refusing a, a C-section and they arrested her and tied her legs together. <laughs> and, it says, so, so that she would not try to have, she would not go into labor at at home um, and brought her to the hospital. Um, uh, they have ordered forced bed rest of women, um, uh, even though there's no medical evidence that bed rest works. Um, we have to worry about miscarriage. Uh, you know, one in, uh, one in five pregnancies end in miscarriage. The, that will now be uh, uh, subject to investigation. Uh, during a period when we're, I'm still just talking about wanted pregnancies, you know, where women are uh, vulnerable, in pain, um, grieving, and there will have to be, uh, if we have fetal personhood, um, uh, that especially that's early on, um, an inquisition into miscarriages. And then, you know, we've always had the exception for the life or health of the pregnant woman, except for in Stenberg v. Carhartt, uh, which did not have a health exception for a particular method of abortion, um, uh, the DNX. But if you had fetal personhood, then you're not going to have the health exception. I don't, I don't know how to justify the health exception for women. So even if it is damaging to her health to carry a pregnancy uh, to term, um, then that exception uh, abortion will not be available to her. And I think we would have to question even if um, it were a danger to her life. So I know there was a famous case in Ireland, Josh, you might know more about that, where a woman died because of that, because, you know, there's always just a chance, right? I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not necessary, but with medical um, care, we're usually talking about percentages. Um, how are you going to weigh that? And especially if you think that, um, if you think of a, a fetus as being innocent, um, and so and so, if you're going to prefer one life over the other, which might you prefer? Why wouldn't you treat them equally? Um, in fact, I think that's the argument Josh is making. So that 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 again is in the context not of. Uh, pregnancy termination, but just in the in, in the context of women who are want very much to have the baby. Um, it, obviously, it would affect abortion rights and limit the choices of women to have an abortion, including in the case of rape um, or situations of other kinds of coercive control. Um, 
that that might occur. One method of uh, coercive control is in a situation of domestic um, uh, dominance, maybe is what I should say, um, when uh, the male is uh, uh, saying that he, there, you know, he, he is infertile or um, using some kind of protection and then does not. Um, so um, uh, if, if the fetus is a person or embryo is a person, um, then it seems like, of course, you would have to not just criminalize abortion with respect to the physicians, they would be murderers and uh, women would uh, be as well. Um, and um, and I, I'm curious if fetuses were persons and abortion then were outlawed, would women still be able to go out of the country to get an abortion? And if that's the case, then we have the continuing problem of abortions always gonna be available to rich women, but uh, not to poor women. And then I guess the final thing, and this came up during the uh, hearings um, about IVF, and I, I just wonder what your thoughts are with respect to that, Josh, um, what this means for the future of IVF. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think uh, one, one thing you might say is, well, that's just, um, uh, we're not gonna freeze any more embryos, uh, which, you know, I can understand that you um, uh, can't freeze persons, but um, but but what are we going to do with the six hundred thousand plus frozen embryos we currently have? So are they all persons? And what does that what what are the consequences of that? I haven't been able to figure out what that would be, although I'm wondering if. Um, you know, other people have pointed out some absurd consequences. I don't think that's an absurd consequence, uh, you know, but th there are other absurd consequences, right? Um, if a, a woman became pregnant while she was in the United States, could you deport her? Because you can't deport the child. Could you, um, you know, can you incarcerate pregnant women because you'd be incarcerating the, the child? Um, you know, so those are some of the is, is some of the other concerns, I, you know, I think the you don't have to go down those extreme kind of absurd questions to to see that there are really consequential and disturbing um, uh, outcomes. And I know you're not taking a consequentialist approach. So I so I so I appreciate that. Um, uh, but at the same time, you can't ignore what the consequences will be, especially when it is not simply when it is consequences that that bear on the personhood of women. So um, anyway, very, very interesting to think about. Um, and Josh, I, I can turn it back to you if you want to um, respond to some of that. I know I just kind of threw a lot in there, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, I was just the respondent. I didn't have to come up with a clear linear argument like you did. You did a great job doing that. Instead, those are just a little bit of my scattered thoughts. Sure, well, uh, Chloe, I don't know if it's all right with you, but I could give a few uh, points and thoughts and some of the thoughtful issues that uh, Professor Shepard gave, and then perhaps we could go to Q&A. Um, I, I think those are, you know, all many of those are very fair points and it's worth considering what the consequences would be. I guess to start with the first point that was raised, which was uh, an issue of basically the minor premise as we as we called it, um, you know, whether when, when does personhood begin, it might be different than biological life. Uh, I guess my response would be that first, uh, I would distinguish between our moral and uh, philosophical approaches to what personhood is, to a legal definition of what personhood is under, you know, traditional, uh, you know, under our constitution and under our common law, where I think that the evidence that I've laid out is that where human life can be shown to exist, their legal personhood is also. So there's really no distinction between human life and legal personhood. Um, I would also be wary of adopting any sort of moral or physical, you know, philosophical per, uh, approach to personhood that would exclude members of the human species in the sense that, you know, we've seen human rights abuses throughout history where certain uh, 
members of the human family have been excluded uh, from the society of persons and, you know, had their rights abused. So, I, you know, whether or not that's happening here, I would certainly be wary of denying personhood to certain members of the human species, if indeed that is what they are. Um, uh, you mentioned also the, the first 14 days, you know, you could have monozygotic twinning or, uh, you know, chimera. I don't think that that um, necessarily undermines the argument for uh, a life exist, human life existing, though, because, you know, for example, monozygotic twinning is, is basically just a form of natural cloning where the zygote splits into two separate human organisms. So if there was a unique living human being organism in existence prior to that event, I, just as when like you cut a flatworm in half, right? The two flatworms are still alive, but it doesn't mean you didn't have a flatworm before you cut it in half. Um, so I guess that would be an example. Um, turning to more to the consequences, there are you know a number of those that were raised, but I guess uh, first, and, and obviously these are very serious consequences too. And I wanna say at the outset that uh, if I'm wrong about this and we you know, adopted personhood in our constitution, then, and you know, there, there are things that, you know, we're, we're stopping women who do wanna have abortions from obtaining them and, and policing, you know, if, if, if these terrible consequences came to pass, I'd be a terrible person. And if, if my premises are wrong, that'd be awful. And so one thing I want my audience to consider is what if, what if your premises are wrong, right? What if you're wrong about the issue of, of abortion? What if it is the taking, intentional and direct taking of a human life? You know, what are, what are the consequences there? But first, uh, you know, in, insofar as surveillance is concerned, I don't think, you know, when you look to the pre-row period or even countries uh, that prohibited abortion until fairly recently, like Malta, uh, Chile as an example, Ireland, uh, you don't see the sorts of mass surveillance on women that, you know, I think that you've described. Uh, you know, in general, those are very progressive, um, developed societies that they don't really have those problems. And yet, until very recently, Ireland banned abortion in all cases, and Chile, I believe, uh, may still ban abortion in all cases. I can't remember if recent legislation just uh, introduced a rape and incest exception. Uh, but basically, and Malta still prohibits abortion. So I think that those are kind of counter examples to the surveillance state that, um, that you've described. Also, I mean, for drug testing, chemical endangerment laws, I think that there's definitely situations of abuse that you've described. I don't think that if you accept the position that the embryo is a person with human right, with rights, constitutional rights, preeminently the right not to be killed. I don't think that entails the view that the law must prohibit all actions that pose a risk to exposing an embryo to unintended death. And so, you know, I think that there, I don't think that we would need the sort of, um, you know, abuses that you were discussing. And I do think that there, you know, there are similar examples. For example, you know, you, you mentioned about, you know, taking the, the child who is just born away from away from her mother, you know, we see similar abuses with, you know, child protective services taking toddlers away from parents, you know, if they have a false positive drug test and stuff like that. So I don't think that that's necessarily, you know, a dispositive argument against personhood in this context. Um, regarding uh, miscarriages, I, I think that once again, I would I think I, I would have two responses to that. First, I think prior to Roe v. Wade, police weren't investigating and prosecuting women who tragically experienced miscarriage. And that wasn't happening in Ireland, Chile, or Malta either. Um, miscarriage, I believe, is a tragedy and, and not a crime. I mean, I think, I hope everyone can agree on that. My wife and I have suffered miscarriage. It's a tragedy. But I think the second response is that it's, I think this argument is a little bit misleading. So in the cases where, and I'm not saying your argument is misleading, I'm saying in the news where it's, they say that like personhood would criminalize miscarriage, a lot of those, you know, factual cases, if you dig into them, are not actually miscarriage. So for example, there was a recent Ohio case where a woman obtained a medical abortion at home. Uh, her baby was born alive, and then they let the child die and put it in a dead, uh, put the child in a shoebox in the garbage. And so she was prosecuted, but I mean, at the point where your child is born and, and then, you know, that indifference to human life, I can understand why that would be. It's, I think it would be improper to, to call that miscarriage. Uh, so I'm not saying you raised that argument, but that, that those sorts of cases have been in the news and they've been described as miscarriage and saying that, you know, personhood would, would result in prosecuting women for miscarriage. And I think that that's a little bit misleading insofar as those news uh, pieces of news are concerned. Uh, regarding, uh, I think the next point was maternal health. Uh, 
Uh, there's, I, I would have two responses to that. First, I, you mentioned Gonzalez v. Carhartt. There was no health exception. I think that actually proves that, uh, that Justice Ginsburg's prediction that uh, the health exception would result in women dying has actually not come true. Uh, we, we haven't seen the sorts of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the of, sorts of dire health consequences that she predicted in her dissent in the, uh, in the Carhartt decision. And then my second response would be that, uh, you know, maternal health care, I don't think is inconsistent with protecting personhood. I've already alluded to the examples of Ireland, Chile, and Malta. Uh, Ireland was actually among the top three safest countries in the world for pregnant mothers with the lowest rates of maternal mortality and morbidity. And they accomplished that while maintaining a total ban on abortion. Uh, Chile is another example. They had the second lowest rate of maternal mortality in the, in the Americas, actually better than the USA while maintaining an abortion ban. And Malta uh, also it's, it has a total abortion ban and has one of the lowest maternal mortality rates in the world. So I think that we can and should try to protect women's health and, uh, and the life of the unborn, you know, treating both patients, making sure that both of their health is considered. Um, See, there's a lot here, but I'm going to go to uh, IVF. What, you know, th th I think that's an interesting question. That one was raised, as you mentioned, in the Amy Cooney Barrett hearings. Um, my first response would be that I don't think that that uh, personhood would not entail ban prohibit prohibiting IVF. Uh, it would simply require IVF clinics to reform their practices so as to require uh, respect for the life of human embryos that they create. So they wouldn't be able to create dozens of embryos, as you mentioned, and then discard and kill unused embryos. Uh, I think it's practical because European countries like Switzerland, Italy, France, and the UK have already have regulations that permit fertilization of embryos, only the ones that will be implanted in the uterus. And so they can, they've demonstrated that it can be done without killing unused embryos. As far as what to do with embryos that are already, have already been created and be frozen, I think that that's a very difficult question. I do know that there are some uh, programs, actually embryo adoption programs. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's called uh, snowflake adoption. Um, you know, I don't know if that's really a solution given the number of, of frozen embryos that have been created. Uh, but it, it will require, I think, uh, you know, it's a difficult problem. And unfortunately, I think the lack of regulation in, in this area of IVF has actually contributed to the problem that we're in now. Um, and then lastly, I guess, just as in terms of some of the absurd consequences that you mentioned, uh, you know, whether incarceration, uh, of a pregnant woman would be a violation of the due process clause or, uh, you know, deportation. I, I guess my first response would be that uh, the constitutional rights have always been tailored for children. So for example, our First Amendment rights of children are treated somewhat differently uh, than for adults. I think the similar, similar approach would be uh, taken to unborn children and preborn children if they're recognized as persons. Obviously, uh, constitutional rights like the not, right not to be searched or seized really doesn't have much applicability to you know, a, 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 a preborn child. And it's not even clear that that right would be, uh, would be there in the constitution. Uh, the, and then the second thing I would say is that um, I wanna take a step back and say that you know, with some of these absurd consequences, I think that we can tailor things uh, you know, from the perspective that um, if you believe that abortion is the taking of a human life and that this is an equal protection violation, I'm less concerned about you know, whether pregnant women are driving in HOV lanes and stuff like that, whether that qualifies. Uh, I, I think that you know, having some perspective about the, the seriousness of the issue is important. I, oh, and last thing on incarceration, I mean, I, we also have daycares for children. In, in many prisons, female uh, women's prisons, where the children are with their you know, mothers incarcerated. And we don't consider that, you know, a due process violation for the two-year-old's rights. Um, so I guess I'll leave it at that. And then I'm sure there'll be, that, that probably raised even more questions. So uh, uh, I will turn it over, I guess, Chloe, if you want to, you have the floor for Q&A. So we've got a, a number of really great, great questions. Um, and so I'll start off by asking one that's directed to Professor Shepard and then one that's directed to Josh, and the one directed to Josh, Professor Shepard, is about the originalism argument. So I think it might touch on some questions that you that you have. Um, so Professor Shepard, one of the questions says, instead of focusing on monitoring women who are pregnant, why not regulate doctors' behavior? There would be far less intrusion into women's lives and also significantly narrow the scope of oversight. Doctors are already prevented per from performing unethical surgeries by law. Burdening the scope of unethical behavior does not seem unduly burdensome. Okay, um, I'm not sure I 
I completely understood the question, but I, I think um, the question was about, you don't have to criminalize the women's behavior, um, but you could just criminalize uh, the physician's behavior. That's, that's gonna be um, one, I think just, just practically difficult uh, now that we have medication abortion. Um, and, uh, and two, I don't know why um, the moral onus would be on the physician rather than the pregnant woman. And I guess three, um, this is not, that would not um, uh, capture the uh, abortions that will take place outside of uh, physician care, which I think would be where, where you would see it happening, you know? So, um, so I, I, I mean, I appreciate that that has been that has been the tactic. I mean, or strategy. I mean, and and doctors are regulated now with respect to abortion for sure. Um, so um, the the personhood um, um, make making fetuses or embryos persons, um, uh, you know, I think changes that changes that. Um, so, Josh, did you want to say anything to that question? The only thing I'll add is I, I think that, you know, the rise of medication abortion does change it, but at least historically, uh, when you look at the precedent when abortion was prohibited in the states, uh, they, they did prosecute the abortionists and they did not, generally speaking, prosecute women who procured abortions. And that was for two reasons. One was that, you know, the primary witness that you would have against the abortionist was the woman herself. Uh, and secondly, the there was, I mean, basically for whether you like it or not, there was a there was a view that women, uh, you know, it basically infant treated in infancy, and that was an, you know perhaps an unfortunate stereotype. But in this case, it worked to, I suppose, women's advantage in the sense that women were not treated as culpable for that action. Uh, be, so those those are the two historical reasons that they that they did not prosecute women for abortions, and I think that. Uh, you know, in general, generally speaking, that that would be that would be perfectly, you know, consistent with what I would expect if person if uh, preborn were considered persons. Okay, the question for Josh says, why do you think that Justice Scalia disagreed with you about the original public meaning of the 14th Amendment? Was the originalist evidence you point to not available to him at the point? Or did he disagree with you about the conclusion you draw from that evidence? That's a great question. And it's one that I wrestled with when I was writing my paper. Uh, I, I, you know, gleaned through all of Justice Scalia's uh, writings and opinions and speeches on this topic and tried to figure out why he came out the way that he did. And I really think that the answer is just that um, he did not do undertake a, a really originalist uh analysis of the question. Uh, if you look at his dissents, for example, he's not looking at the original public meaning of what happened or, or of, of person. He's not even looking really at the history of abortion law in the United States. It's more of an argument about, you know, responding to the majority opinion saying that there is a constitutionally protected right to abortion. And then in his speeches, it's generally more informal. He was, uh, I think, very committed to the idea of democratic choice theory. And I think that played a large role in the, the final decision, you know, the final, you know, place he came out at. Uh, but I don't really think that he ever undertook, or at least he didn't in his writings, undertake any serious original, originalist analysis of the question. Uh, can I jump in there? Of course. Yeah, so I had a question about that, um, which is just, I mean, how, how do you factor in, like, with respect to in, in originalist uh, theory, factor into your analysis, the fact that um, that women weren't allowed to vote when the 14th Amendment was ratified. Um, and so uh, I guess one, how, how does that factor into understanding what, how the language should be understood, uh, understood by um, what part of the public, by the entire public, the you know, it wouldn't be the entire public because it wouldn't include children, uh, uh, right? So um, would it include voting members of the public? Would it include members of the public who are uh, treated as children, which you just alluded to, women being treated that way? 
um, you know, earlier with respect to abortion uh, regulation. Um, and uh, so how, how is that? And then, and then we're women. So that's part one, I guess. And then part two is um, under the originalist uh, interpretation, were women considered persons under the 14th Amendment if they weren't actually given equal protection in terms of the vote? I yeah, took that, another amendment. Yeah, that's, thank you for that question. That's, that's a great question. Um, so I guess my, my answer would be that yes, they were considered full persons in the sense that if a, if a woman were, for example, the victim of a homicide, they would be treated as a person, uh, as, a, as a victim, a human victim, and the murderer would be you know, charged with homicide. Uh, with respect to certain civic rights, as you mentioned, like voting rights, for example, uh, I don't think under an originalist perspective of the 14th Amendment, those actually would have been included in the Equal Protection Clause. And that's why we needed an amendment for the, the suffragettes needed the amendment to, to obtain voting rights. Um, but the original meaning of the Equal Protection Clause is certainly that the protection of the laws, right? We're thinking about at a time when in the South, especially there were killings, extrajudicial mm -hmm. violence against mm -hmm. African-Americans. Uh, and the purpose of, of that equal protection of the laws was to ensure that a state wouldn't withdraw its protections from some you know, disfavored subclass, whether it was you know, women or uh, African-Americans, whatever it might be. Uh, and I think that that's, at least in that specific narrow sense, specifically like, especially about criminal law, uh, that's how I would respond. They, would, they were considered certainly full persons in that sense. And to be clear, I want to deplore the fact that in the, fa in the past, we, women were not treated with full you know, civic and political equality. Uh, so just to be so we're clear on that, uh, you know, I, I think that that's wrong. But on the originalist perspective, equal protection of the law has a very specific meaning and would especially and, and in its focal meaning apply to the criminal law. Oh, is it primarily about the criminal law? I think in a, from an, an originalist perspective, it would certainly encompass, it certainly encompasses beyond criminal law, but I think that that's at least one of the main aims, you know, that they were certainly trying to address uh, with both the civil rights law that preceded the 14th Amendment and then the 14th Amendment itself. So another question that we have is for Professor Shepard. Um, mm -hmm. Question says, you mentioned the distinction between the legal biological humans. Many distinctions between those two categories that I have seen seem over-inclusive, excluding from personhood individuals such as infants and those with mental handicaps. What tools should be used in determining legal personhood? Oh, well, I, I think that's a, a great question. I would say, um, so I haven't written about this or studied this, so I, I, I'm just giving you what I've got off the top of my head, but um, I would say uh, uh, living human beings, you know? So, um, uh, although we talk about dead persons, right? So uh, living human beings are people who were living, you know, and then have um, died. We still call them persons. Um, the, um, with respect to, uh, you know, it's interesting what you're seeing now, um, kind of more on the international stage with the, word person to the extent person means membership within a group, which I, um, uh, which I, I'm not suggesting that other living human beings be excluded from the group, um, uh, but, but, but thinking about it, in fact, in a more expansive way in terms of non-human animals. Um, so like you have in um, Spain, for example, um, uh, the consideration of um, certain primates as persons. So I think that's interesting. I'm not saying I'm advocating for that, uh, but, but, that's, but that's interesting. I respond a little bit to something that Josh said with respect to he's looking at what the law is and that's separate from what moral and, moral and philosophical writing is. And, and I guess I would disagree with that. Um, because I think the law is based in morality. Um, and, um, and so when we talk about these terms, I mean, what it, the law is, you know, the law is what we make it through language. And uh, that, is a, that is a language of morality and philosophy, I think. 
Um, so that's, I don't know if that gets us here or there, but I, I just note that you had said something like that. And um, as if the law is some, some creature that is not human made, uh, just as uh, moral and philosophical theory. I, I guess I disagree with. Yeah, and I think we have common ground on that. I, I would agree with you that there is a morality underpinning the law. And so I, I think we actually have common ground there. I, 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 what I was trying to say at least was that I think that uh, insofar as we're interpreting specific terms of the constitution from a legal perspective, like person or property, even though those are certainly morally imbued terms, I would, I would view them at least from an originalist perspective as looking at what those terms meant at the time. And, you know, of course, free to debate whether that's the pr proper mode of constitutional methodology or not. Okay, let's do one more question. Um, so this one's for Josh, but of course, Professor Shepard, if you'd like to chime in. It says, how would you reconcile an unborn child's right to life provided by the 14th Amendment with a mother's same right to life when a high-risk pregnancy strongly jeopardizes her chance of survival? Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a, a very important question. Um, I would, I think that you, doctors should treat both patients and try to maximize, uh, obviously, the, the probability that both patients would survive. Not, that's not always going to be the case, and that's not always going to be possible. But I think that that should be treated as a tragedy and not an, intent, an intended uh, and purposeful outcome. Uh, and I think that that's consistent with what we see in other countries that have prohibited abortion. Uh, as I mentioned before, some of the other countries that actually have high rates of maternal health and the way that they approach those sort of uh, situations is to treat them both. Uh, one resource I think is helpful is uh, called the Dublin Declaration. Uh, if you look that up, it's uh, Dublin Declaration on Maternal Health Care. They're experts in uh, epidemiology, uh, cancer, treatment of cancer in pregnancy, uh, other, other sorts of um, issues like that that arise during uh, pregnancy. And they actually found that, uh, or at least their position was that the direct and intentional uh, taking of an unborn life is never necessary to save the life of uh, of a mother, and so that's that's their perspective. They always saw that they they are argued that uh, there's always a way to treat those things in a way that doesn't intentionally and directly uh, take an unborn human life. But that's that's something that I found was interesting. And obviously, I'm not a physician, so I can't speak to that personally. But uh, at least that's my understanding, and I, I see that we see the evidence of that in other countries that have protected both women's health and the life of the unborn. Uh, I, I will say, I mean, just, just within the last few years, I know of a case in which um, it, uh, it, uh, a medical case that would challenge that idea that, that you could always, um, you know, try to, um, to treat both. I, I don't know if you really answered the question, like if it really came to, to, to having to choose, what should the choice be? Well, I think that you have to rely on a doctor's judgment on that. I mean, certainly in a case of, for example, ectopic pregnancy, there's no, generally speaking, there's, there's very low likelihood that a uh, child would actually survive an ectopic pregnancy, but the course of treatment wouldn't be, you know, the purpose of going in and, and removing the uh, embryo in that case is not the intentional destruction of life, right? But a premature delivery where unfortunately the child wouldn't survive. Um, you know, oh, for so you're kind of talking about the doctrine of double effect, is that? Is that, yeah, I, so, think that, I think that that could be one. Uh -huh. I mean, certainly uh -huh. there are medical ethics guidelines that you probably know more about than, than I do on, on those sorts of things. But, you know, as far as like cancer treatment of pregnancy, you know, going undergoing uh, chemotherapy, mm -hmm. and stuff, that's not the intentional and direct killing of the unborn child, right? Even if it may foreseeably result in the death of that child. So, I mean, I think that uh, you should definitely be trying to save both patients. And unfortunately that's not always possible. And a lot of times that means the preborn child will not survive, but that should be treated as a, as a tragedy rather than an intended outcome. Right, but that's, uh, you can treat it as a tragedy. It seems, I'm sorry, I know we're over time. It seems like you can, you can treat it as a, as a tragedy and you can, uh, under our current way of thinking, you know, uh, uh, you can treat it as an unintended consequence, but if actually the personhood of these, uh, uh, of the uh, fetus and the, the pregnant woman are equal, 
um, then then that would call for maybe a different way of thinking about it than to be thinking, you know, th than what you're talking about. Um, in other words, why why choose? I, I don't know why you would leave that to a physician if it's a moral issue. Yeah, and and I, like I said, you probably have more medical knowledge than yeah. I do. But I do refer people to the Dublin Declaration. I think it is yeah. a helpful tool, and they the presentations from the Com Committee on Excellence in Maternal Healthcare addresses a lot of these questions, like yeah. cancer treatment and pregnancy. Uh, yeah, what to do in these sorts of situations. Yeah. I'd probably refer. I mean, to that. Yeah, well, one example you'd have is if you had a woman who, a pregnant woman who gets the flu and then has a, the, the load on the respiratory system has flu and pneumonia and the load on the respiratory system, and I'm not talking like a doctor, I'm not a doctor, um, is, is such that it, 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 the extra load because of the pregnancy means that the you know the 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 woman's chance of surviving the the flu and pneumonia is is impeded by the pregnancy and i know there have that is not a, a unfortunately because these are wanted pregnancies right uh, because and they have been brought pretty far along for there to be such a load right on the on the heart and respiratory system um but in those cases, you know, decisions are are made uh, by the woman, not by the physician, right? By the woman, uh, tragically, uh, in order to save her life. So, um, so this is a question more, I think, of the the state making that decision. Um, yeah, I know we're up against our current stop, but I, I do want to say that I think that, you know, these can be difficult uh, questions. My understanding, at least from the medical perspective that I don't know as much about, is that, that at least the intentional going in, uh, you know, committing an abortion, which is a, a violent act, uh, is actually not, you know, not never necessary for, for treating these sorts of ailments. But I will defer to people with more medical judgment than I do, and I'll stick to the law. Well, great. Thank you both so much for participating. Um, very much appreciate it. To our audience, I apologize for not getting to a lot of your great questions, um, but I did want to highlight our event next Monday at 7 p.m. Um, we will be partnering with Virginia Law Woman, and Vice Dean Leslie Kendrick will be interviewing Professor Lillian Bevere about her career as the first female faculty at UVA, so that'll be on Monday at 7 p.m., and again, thanks so much to our panelists. That was fantastic. I appreciate both of your insights and expertise. Um, and to our audience, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's always hard to talk about these issues. These are not easy issues to talk about, you know, but it's, it's nice to be able to talk about them, everybody, you know, operating in good faith and trying to wrestle with the complex issues. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for a great, respectful conversation.